now that the session has formally begun, uh, I need to express how happy I am to be back in the company of friends who have been constant source of inspiration all these years, uh, Dr. Sandeep Shastri and Dr. Shailaji Shastri. And I'm so happy also to be able to speak in his new institution in Madhya Pradesh. Um, my way of beginning this talk uh, is first of all, trying to tell you uh, a few customary steps. One of which is I always tend to forget to list all the names to whom I should thank as I begin. And in this context, I would like to particularly thank Dr. Shastri's Sandeep and Shailaja uh, for facilitating this sharing of ideas with you. To Dr. Vinay Joshi, who is chairing this session. To Dr. Roli Hare, whom I have hitherto been referring to as Roli Agarwal. So Roli Agarwal Hare. And to all the participants who are here, it's nice that I have a chance to share a couple of, or a few of my reflections, if I may say. Now, these reflections have a context in which they have originated. First of all, it is my senior citizenship status. Now that you have reached a certain age where you get the status called senior citizen, you have things to look forward to. I'm not saying there is nothing to look forward to, but every step you look forward to, you also look behind and look at what you have done hitherto, how it was and so on. So there has been quite a bit of reflection of and over my career path as it has been. So in a way, the invitation to speak here makes a uh, uh, gives me an opportunity to consolidate those thoughts, even though tentatively. Second, of course, the inspiration has come not only the senior citizenship of looking backwards, but also uh, a formal retirement from institutional employment. Uh, as you introduced me just now, uh, only thing is that you spoke in the present tense, they all should be past tense, uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, I have retired and therefore there is plenty of time and you're no longer holding an official position. And in that sense, there is no deadlines. So you have plenty of time to reflect. There is a lot of free, free floating ideas. Now these free floating ideas happen also because of a very unfortunate episode in our life story or in our life history, namely the pandemic and the accompanying black dog. So you're stuck to a chair or an easy chair and you're watching a television or reflecting on things as they were or wondering what you will do each day. That prompts us for what I would call auto-ethnographic reflection. I would have said biographical, but autobiographical. But here you try to combine your academic insights into your own life and therefore an autoethnographic uh, reflection. Uh, what I'm going to talk is also inspired by my watching, apart from other programs on television, the binge series and so on, because there's plenty of time at hand, but also listening to TED talks on mobile phones or on computers. And when I watch these TED talks on very interesting topics, uh, one of the things that come to my mind is pedagogic skills. How well the person is speaking or presenting and how systematic it is and so on, which also tells me, and I must repeat this point to each of you here, that there is no one best way of teaching or one best way of speaking. You already heard six speakers and I'm told I'm the seventh and you have to endure another five more, uh, if not with as much of pain as in my case, but that's fishing, but you will have to. But then let me also say that each of us bring one's own style of presentation, one's own, one's own style of uh, teaching or lecturing and so on, which is a result of one's own personal experience. So, the point I wish to make there is that there is no one best 
or the only way to do it. But for me, when I listen to others or when I'm Have, when I have to attend a couple of lectures and so on, I'm apart from trying to learn what they're saying, the content of their talk. The other thing which I'll be focusing, and that has been a almost a pastime with me, is if I were to be saying the same, how would I do it? Or what are the things that I should avoid if I were to be speaking this and so on? In other words, I will be in, improvising. So if I was listening to TED Talks or if I was making an autoethnographic reflection of my career, I wonder what I would be doing if I started my career all over again. And as I was thinking of that, I received a phone call from Dr. Shastri to speak on this, which was nice. And so I'm putting them all together. Let me also say, and all this is by way of introducing a point of departure for my talk. Let me also say that all these reflections, they don't have a reverse gear. In reality, I cannot go back to 1977 or 1981 when I started my teaching career and therefore start all over again. This is just looking at the rear view mirror without necessarily going back. But then perhaps whatever else is available for me to go ahead, I will probably be guided by them. But more importantly, share it with you. Share it not with the idea that this alternative is the best way or that was the best way and so on. Just sharing it for you to reflect as you like. Since this is all about teaching as a career, I, it's appropriate that I make a dedication. And a small footnote when I say dedication, uh, during this pandemic, uh, the past one and a half years, I've been told by my friends I've also had a chance to listen to a couple of lectures where I'm told many of my students who were presenting similar talks in a forum of this nature or typical na similar nature uh, would have dedicated their talk to my favorite teacher or my teacher, Professor Karan Paspar, or any other way by which they referred to me. It was nice, a very nice feeling. And therefore, I too think I should do a similar thing of dedicating this talk this talk about career, about teaching career. I would first of all dedicate it to all my students because teaching them made me realize where I was at short or I was short or what else I had to acquire and so on. But equally I must thank and gra with gratitude all my teachers from primary school upwards, you know, class one. I, I still remember Uh, some of my primary school teachers, uh, but more of what I speak today probably reflect upon my learnings from my teachers after my collegiate days. Although I didn't want to name all of them or some of them, I would probably be doing injustice by not taking a few names. It's not important that you should dig up and see, maybe some of them are available in Google, but I'll nevertheless mention it because I'm dedicating it to them. Professor P. Ramachandran at PISS Mumbai, Professor M. N. Shinivas who guided my doctoral research, Professor T. K. Uman in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and I'm going to mention two more names. Whenever somebody says that you have done a good job of teaching or talking, I, when I reflect, I realize amount of influence that these two names, which I'm about to mention, had on me in my public speaking or uh, uh, lectures and so on. Professor Rudy Baumgartner and Professor Rudy Hager, both from a university in Switzerland, but the amount of learning I've had from them in teaching or participation in seminar and so on is just not, I cannot really Com comprehend everything that I have to say. So with grateful thanks. Of course, there is thanks also to members of my family uh, who make it possible for me to speak. And having said all this, let me move on to the actual topic. How am I going to structure this talk? Ever since Dr. Shastri called me over phone and asked me I should talk, 
I have had several avatars of what I want to do this. I didn't sit down and write to, to, to tell you the truth. It was this morning that I finalized my PowerPoint. But in my mind, there were several avatars of this talk that went on. And I can tell you already in anticipation, after I conclude this talk, I would have reflections again and say, oh, I should have said this way or that way. I should have chosen that avatar or this avatar. However, as I have frozen now, what is the avatar that I have for this talk? First, as I look back, my focus is more on teaching than on research. Gain another footnote here. Why am I not talking much about research? Aren't research and teaching something that are two wheels of uh, a profession that we call as uh, academic uh, career and so on? Uh, but then I think I may need one more session for research. So please take note of my pending topic. But I will, of course, refer to research also. Secondly, I need to say that when I look back and if I say that I want to start all over again, it, is, it doesn't mean that I have regrets. It doesn't mean that, oh, I wish I had done this way, that way, and all that I have done, therefore, is a waste. And no, no, not that. It is basically a, a way by which I would reflect upon my past with a view for improvisation. In a way, it is also wishful thinking. Thirdly, how did my teaching career begin? That was going to be a, a separate slide or a separate subsection in my talk in the original structure. But considering the amount of time I've already taken, I'll make some adjustment and say a few things here itself and stop on that. How did it begin? I think there was the, the if I look back, the first time I ever did the role of a teacher was in my primary school, where my teacher, after about one hour, half an hour of teaching, it was, by the way, uh, although there were four different classes in the primary school, first standard, second standard, third standard, fourth standard, it was a single classroom and a single teacher. And therefore, at the end of an hour or so, he would probably want to go smoke a BD or go have a cup of coffee or have a snack somewhere. And he would invariably ask the boy who was sitting in the front bench first seat, look after the class, he would say, and he would go away. In other words, I was being made the monitor. And I would be given a book to read, and that is equivalent to teaching those days. But why did I develop a passion for it? It gave me a certain amount of authority over probably a hundred students in this classroom. This authority was important because I was physically so puny that in normal life, every one of them dominated me. And the only occasion when I had a chance to dominate or even show my existence was when I was made the class monitor. So you can imagine why I always promoted smoking and having a coffee by my teacher. Because each time he went, I would take, a, take the desk and do this. But this was my earliest. But that was just to introduce the way. It so happened that after my master's, my teacher was so fond of me that they practically invited me to come and take a position that was available in the college where I had been a graduate student. And I started off. That is a very important experience for me. I'm going to speak a little more about it soon, but I will tell you that I had some kind of a free swimming, or what is it called? You jump into a swimming pool and have a freestyle. You have no elegance of what you're doing. You have no idea of how you must really appear when you're swimming and so on. All you have to do is, okay, the bell has rang and the classes have begun and you must speak. You must teach. There was hardly any experience that I had. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I had for those initial years was to establish my authority over the knowledge. The knowledge that I was sharing with my students the idea of sharing still wasn't there. It was basically flow of idea from me to the students than spreading the ideas across in a classroom. 
But then the students were always worried because two or three years ago, they had seen me in the same college as a student. And they, they couldn't somehow accept that this man could be a teacher for you. Now I can go on elaborating on this, but the key, key issue here is, although as a teacher, I'm sharing the knowledge that I'm supposed to possess, how do I establish that authority? How do I establish the legitimacy for that authority? That was my problem. And it becomes even worse as it did for me that many of my senior teachers who employed me, including the principal and the management, so to say, all of who were fond of me, but they wanted to go through the procedures. And one of the procedures was that I must give a demonstration lecture. And you go to this classroom and give a demonstration lecture when every one of them know that my fate depends upon whether they keep quiet or not. So there was already a vulnerability of my authority that had been exposed beyond which I had to establish that look here, I know my subject. I will have a little more to say about this, but let me tell you that this is how it began. And once you are at that stage, you have no control over what you teach. I may be now saying that I'm teaching as if I'm teaching to you guys. No, I'm trying to explain my experience, my own understanding of these concepts or theories or processes had its own analytical insights as an intelligent student in the classroom. But the classroom now that I'm supposed to be handling as a teacher had limited space for making use of them because anything you think and say has to be within the prescribed syllabus, has to be in a given format by which a question may be asked in the examination and has to be in a text which my students could go to the library and read from within parentheses that may be there in these books or some older student has already underlined them. So it's easy for you instead of having to do a cut and paste as you now do. Of course, those days we didn't have highlighting, but you had these by which they could go and see. Sir, whatever you say is not to be seen in the books. That's how they would otherwise come back and your knowledge therefore becomes suspect. And that is a terrible thing to live through. I have gone through that too. Now, what else did I do as a teacher? Over, as somebody said, I, over 20 years of researching, I had also occasions to become a consultant. Now, Professor Mishra just now told me that he's also an IQAC member or chairperson of that. And one of the prerequisites today to establish the credentials of a university or a college is that the faculty should be engaged in consultancies. At the time when I did this, it was not such a thing, but somehow people found that I was able to contribute to some policies or evaluation of a policy and so on, as a result of which I did get into consultancy mode also. But that was a trap, let me tell you. It was given the career path that we had, having started a new family at that time, the income that came additionally from consultancy was so interesting and important for your existence, for your class ideas of buying a car, building a house and so on, that we became consultancy slaves rather than academic slaves. Or you kept on looking for opportunities. In fact, the network that we developed by way of contact with people always had a hook there that he should or she should eventually call me or suggest my name for a consultancy opportunity. But that too I have done. If I were to redo my career today, probably I would minimize my focus on them and focus on other things, namely writing and publications, which also I have done, but I, I wish the, when I know that I have so much of time at hand and wonder what all I did or could have done, I would think, oh, how I wish I had finished this, how I finished I had written that and so on. So there has been publishing of books and papers. All this made up 
what has been my past. But if I were to look back at them, how well did I do it? I may not exhaust on each of these. That also is part of my structure of the, of the avatar of this talk. I'll try to address some of these at random. Let me just go back to my teaching years. I've already said quite a few. I said I would refer to this, but I know I made quite a bit of references to all my ideas that I had under the heading teaching years. I referred to my absence of first-hand experience of many things uh, that was subject matter that I was teaching. I'll not go too much of detail into it, but then there was uh, a topic on, let us say, social problems. All that knowledge that I had was more bookish at that time, rather than anything that I have even had a chance to debate, discuss with others. But they were all passed on to me as a syllabus that was given by the university, and I had no chance of meddling with it. The real challenges then was, even after I moved on to university where, or at least I had gained a little seniority to be able to have a say in syllabus making, the, the challenge was that by the time that you have gained two or three years of experience in teaching a given discipline, because by a given paper, an area of specialization, or what you're offering as a course, and so on, by two or three years, a couple of things used to happen. One, I think if there is one thing that we have been crazy in our country is change. Change the syllabus. So syllabus would change. Two, you have to circulate. So why should Karan alone be teaching sociology of development? Why not somebody else also to do it? Give an opportunity for another person to do it and you take over the other discipline which he or she was teaching. Why do I mention this? Yes, there has to be circulation of knowledge and authority over knowledge and I don't deny that. But as a challenge in the career, was that by the time I had reached second or third year of teaching at a, a certain discipline, discussions in the classroom or my raising issues or students in their raised issues threw up a lot of ideas, threw up a lot of questions which I felt needed further debating, further reflections. I'll give you one example. I know you come from a range of different disciplines, though fortunately non-STEM disciplines, but I will make a reference as an example of how new ideas or certain curiosities got provoked. One of them was I used to teach Marx and I used to teach Durkheim. Durkheim comes up with a theory of anomie and Marx comes up with a theory of alienation. Although, both of them owe it to other people, be it Hegel or others. But there is a theory that I've been teaching as alienation and anomie. And if you look at the content of it, there is a lot of overlap between the two. I said by the time second year as I was teaching this, I said, isn't there an interesting way by which I can compare and contrast anomie and alienation? Will that approach be not a new way of appreciating the work of Marx and that of Durkheim? This thought had come to me, but by the time the thought was crystallized in my mind, the year started and I was told that I must change the, the subject. I should opt some other discipline, uh, some other paper and not this because someone else would take this over. I would of course tell that person also look here, why don't you bring this up? But then that depended upon the seriousness with which I could engage in such a conversation and the seriousness with which all this sincerity with which each other had a commitment over that issue. Why am I referring to this? One of the biggest challenges of teaching is that we seem to have touch me not attitude towards what we do or uh, not touch me not. There is. Uh, you just touch and by the time you come in contact with it, it begins to hold itself or disappear. As a result, all that experience of yours goes waste. I've had plenty of such ideas which 
was beginning to consolidate as a possibility of looking at it. But by the time I was able to lay hands on it, structure was such that I had to change, I had to take a new discipline and so on. For instance, there was sociology of development, which I designed without really knowing how many other universities were offering that course. But by the time I had spent two or three years and I was beginning to be on top of the course, I had to change. A very closely related factor or a uh, closely related uh, issue in this matter is that there is a tendency for you also to pass over instead of going in depth about an issue. Now, the fact that Dr. Sandeep Shastri and Dr. Shailaja are there in the audience here. As I'm about to say, and a thought crosses my mind, oh, in my previous lecture, I had already referred to this. So let me not bore them. Let me not say too much about it. Instead, I just move over. This happened also for me in teaching. You, the first year when you have designed a course and you're offering, you go so well into it. But by the time the second and the third or subsequent years, there is a tendency of monotonizing. A tendency of monotonizing, which makes you therefore not really raise all the issues. You may have seen this in ordinary conversations. If you have told a story to somebody about something that you have seen or observed, you may go analytically so much into detail, but if you have to repeat the same to the next person, <coughs> already you begin to simplify them, you begin to consolidate them, you begin to probably distort also if necessary or add on things. And by the time you have reached the end, you don't know whether you are narrating the same or a different one. This was a kind of a problem I used to face in my career. Now, how will I overcome that? I don't know yet, but if I were to start all over again, there is probably a need for me to focus on this. There may be some way by which I keep track of my analytical insights, not closing them, but not ignoring them when I make a next attempt at looking at it. I think that's an art that we need to really specialize in if we have to be good teachers. A third problem I had, and this I think has continued for a very long time. Uh, so if I was in a confession box in a church or in a cathedral, I would probably be making this confession. There was an Anglican arrogance in me. This Anglican arrogance is that do not speak in local language. Even if I knew the local language, I would not speak in local language because, because of the arrogance that I had towards language and English medium means it should be English and nothing else. I probably continuously restricted the spread of knowledge to a whole lot of people who are not comfortable with English as much as I may have been. I still remember, for instance, in the very first few years in Mangalore and even lately, uh, how I would not use a, a, a non-English word in my speech, in my talk, in my writing, and so on. It's only now that I have begun to use the local language or language of the listener besides the language of what I have as my mastery over. But this Anglican arrogance, if I may use that as a phrase, probably deprived the ability of quite a few of my listeners to really grasp what I say. My third footnote in this talk, just prior to this lecture, I sent a note to a few of my friends asking them, is there anything that you would have found as difficult to deal with me as a teacher? Can you just highlight? And three of them pointed out that you insisted on being English speakers, sir. And we always had problems finding equivalent of it. Today you have uh, Google and uh, Bing and whatever, where you can use a word and find the equivalent translation. Uh, but those were the days when it was not that easy. More so if you are teaching a theoretical topic, uh, because they were all written in German or in English or other such languages, which I too didn't know, but then my communication restricted it completely to English and probably I practiced a linguistic exclusion those days 
we talk of social exclusion, maybe I already did quite a bit of linguistic exclusion. Another major weakness that I had or fault I had as a teacher was a smart focus or an intelligent focus. This happens to all of us, I must tell you. When we are in a classroom, the quality, or I wouldn't use the word quality because that would already be judgmental. The reception capacity of students would vary. And as a speaker, please look back at my early days, especially when I was uncertain, uncertain myself over my authority on what I was speaking. Given all that, you're looking for a sympathetic audience or an audience which is intelligent, who show signs of learning or understanding what he's saying rather than the dull students. Over a period of time, I think we begin to focus exclusively on the smart student and not the dullards. Just as I did in linguistic exclusion, probably I did a similar thing by way of excluding many, many students who are mediocre or lower than that. I'm sorry for the use of the word mediocre, but as a teacher, I think it would have been my responsibility to pull them all together in a similar fashion. I can go on listing this, but I need to stop somewhere, consolidate so that you can reflect. In all my teaching, no matter how participative the discussions or lecturing was, the room for expression or expression of doubts or clarification and so on came always at the end. So a teacher who allows participation, allows participation only at the end and not in between. <clears throat> As a result, there was a tendency that the students would have already endured you for one hour or whatever the length of your lecture. And if there was one thing that they were really eager, it was that your lecture got over. So I don't think even if they had doubts or questions to ask, they really had enough spirit to raise them. The point I'm making is that I think in pedagogic skills, if I were to teach today, I would probably pause every now and then and open up for questions. If somebody raised a hand, allow the person to speak and give a, raise a question or two or even question my knowledge about it and so on, such that it becomes a two-way process all along rather than a two-way process, but only at one point of time and not always. How do I conclude this? This teaching years that I had, the, uh, the little things that I shared with you. I would think that most of us start our career, as I said, by jumping into the pool and then have freestyle swimming without really acquiring the skill and so on. But I don't know, in many, many, many of you are youngsters, probably you did not even know there existed a class in the teaching profession. When we started our career, you first are appointed, not as an assistant professor or the lecturer or something like that, you would be appointed as a demonstrator. Soon after you have qualified yourself did the minimum qualification masters in a college teaching, you would be first appointed as a demonstrator where your job is one of assorted assistants to your senior teachers. And you may get a chance to go and teach there, but you're really demonstrating your skills. And then you go on to being, having acquired some skills, becoming a lecturer where you have jumped into water and learned to swim, but then you become a reader where you now spend more time learning, reading afresh in the light of your demonstration and in the light of your teaching as a lecturer. And you arrive at some ideas, some thesis, which you profess as a professor. This was the way in which uh, uh, the teaching profession evolved, especially in Europe. And we inherited that system here. And that happened even during the 50s. As I grew up and I came to college, uh, we would refer to a teacher as, oh, he's only a demonstrator, or he's a professor, or she is a lecturer, and so on. I think we need a little bit of reinvention of this all over again. 
if not as an excuse of something or the other, but we need to do this afresh. If I had more time, I would dwell on that, but I know that the approach in your university is new, perhaps then the neoliberal education that you're planning should have a little bit of this approach too, such that the teacher begins to know the strokes in a swimming pool. Now, I did not exhaust, but if I were to be a better teacher, then what do I do? We have to establish, we have to arrive at an equilibrium here. This is a hard situation to establish, but that equilibrium is to find a balance of what is it that the students want and what is it that I'm trying to do. To find this and to arrive at an equilibrium there, to arrive at a balance is not an easy joke. There, I mean, the more I look at options available, I think it has to be something that has to be situationally defined. As for the student's concern, I told you already, he or she is more interested in, is it in the syllabus? Are there books or now are material available in, in the web for her or him to read and to reproduce them for examination? And if so, in what way will a question be formulated on whatever you teach? Yeah, all the other analytical things you do will not be of any relevance. My fourth footnote. Please recall I told you about my insight or a curiosity I developed about anomie and alienation. Towards the third or fourth year when I was teaching the paper, I did have a chance to raise this and spend about five, six sessions on that. And then I heard a comment being made. What, how is it relevant for us in our syllabus? That question was coming from the students and I had to now wonder about it. The point I'm making is that if I have to be a better teacher, I don't think I can enforce this new ideas by itself, but the skill of making it not only relevant, but also interesting enough for them, such that knowledge is open to further interpretation than as a package. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Mishra, I have just about two more slides, but feel free to tell me if I'm running out of time. <clears throat> just because I like an idea or an I speak about, oh, I said Dr. Mishra, I'm sorry, I apologize, Dr. Joshi. Um, just because an idea is good, it's interesting, I think as a teacher, I should know when to stop what I'm saying. This is not a reminder again to you, but if I were to be a better teacher, just because this was interesting, I can't go on talking about it. No matter how much you speak about it, the total marks that can be given to that is only five and not more. So you have to apportion your talk. In that sense, don't dwell on something merely because it's interesting or because it's fascinating for you to speak about. I think, the third challenge that I have is to be able to arouse doubts. At the end of a lecture, if I convince everything and go, I don't think I have really done my job. I need to really arouse doubts in the minds of my students such that there can be some further drilling, regeneration of ideas of what has already been consolidated. Even if it goes nowhere, let it flourish, let it float around. That's a third point that I would make as my new challenges. Just as a distraction to you, but a fourth one. I don't know how many of you watched uh, Wimbledon and uh, uh, Australian Open or French Open tennis. I don't know how many of you watch tennis, but if you have watched Rafael Nadal playing, He's a fantastic player, but somehow my whole concentration on watching him play has been his rituals of rubbing his eyes, his nose and his shirt and then serving rather than appreciating the technique of his play. What I'm saying is that as teachers, we have a similar 
trap in us. Teacher-driven distraction, I call it. It could be, as a student myself, I, I was engaged in doing this. How many times did the teacher say, so on and so forth? How many times did the teacher say, uh, er, 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 on I mean, I mean, I mean, and so on. It became for us a competition amongst us in the classroom, not to have missed a single such ritual of a teacher rather than concentrating on what he or she was teaching. What am I saying here? I think we need to overcome this kind of a, a, a tendency that we have. Uh, a chief economic advisor of the present prime minister, he didn't succeed by the way, uh, a very well-known economist. But in order to make one simple point that uh, the market will respond to it like this or that if we do this, if he had to say that, he would probably have half an hour of um, uh, 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 what I mean, uh, uh, and he would go on. Why am I referring to this? I think as teachers, we have a failing in this. When we don't know, when the ideas are not flowing in our minds, or if we are unable to locate what we have to see and so on, we tend to engage in this. I think this becomes a teacher distraction. There are enough distractions for students as it is. I would rather minimize this kind of a distraction. My fifth point. I hope you have kept count of my fifth point. I said my first, second, third, and fourth, and so on. And I also made my footnotes where I have come to four footnotes. I'm yet to make a fifth footnote. My fifth point is we have a tendency to go on talking by saying secondly and secondly till we reach hundredth, but we'll still we'll be counting secondly, which is also a ritual problem. But I think I would avoid if I were to be a good teacher doing that. If you don't know something, admit you don't. In the very second year of my postgraduate teaching, I was asked a question in a class. And I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed or shy of admitting it. At the conclusion of my lecture, this was again on Marx. A student of mine asked me a question. So what's the difference between communism and socialism? And believe me, I didn't know it. I had no answer. And I was stunned. I, I, was, I didn't know how to go forward. I didn't know how to reflect. And later I realized probably I would have been much more elegant by admitting, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. A while ago when Dr. Shastri and I were talking, he said, fortunately, we are a non-STEM university, sir. And I had to be honest and tell him that I, I'm sorry, I don't know what STEM is. Then he explained, so now I'm with competence, I can say you're STEM or non-STEM. What am I saying here? If as a teacher, we don't know some things, there is no harm in telling you that, look here, there is some doubts about what I'm telling you and I need to go back to this. I'll get back to you on this a little more, but for the time being, keep that aside and let's move on with something else. I think that is something that I would like to do next time when I begin to give a lecture, rather than bluffing my way pretending I know everything about it and make a bloody fool of myself on that. I need to speak a little more about it, about my next bullet, so to say, and that is, if I were to teach, I would have Jugal Bandi henceforth. I referred to two professors, Professor Rudy Baumgartner and Professor Rudy Hugger, I'll tell you, I was fascinated by a few lectures that they both walk into a classroom and deliver. It's when I watch television and watch panel discussions, I see a chaotic confusion there. But here is panel teaching where two or three teachers are simultaneously engaging a class of students and teach. I can tell you, it is one of the richest experience. Even as a teacher, you can improvise yourself. You can learn many things that you had doubts about. You can fill many gaps that you may have had, but it has its own pitfalls. When you disagree over some things, or if there are divergent views, it's okay that you resolve it as teachers, Jugal Bandi performers, but 
students should not be left with in a lurch as, as to what to make out of it. If I were to be starting my career again, I would probably engage in this kind of a jugal bandi and try to perfect it if possible. That is a, a, a thing that I would keep myself as a possibility. My fifth footnote. This jugal bandi in a Zoom is going to be even greater challenge because how to share a screen, how to bring the other person and are both of us visible and will both of us be able to communicate without making a noise at the other end and so on. But this also needs to be acquired. Let me now land as the aircraft lands. So I'm going towards the end of my talk. I would like to gain grips over the subject that I'm teaching. As of now, the grip that I begin to have is only enough to be able to handle a class. But I would like to have a grip in a manner when, since I made a reference to Jugal Bandi, I go back to that. You know, when you, when you watch a performance and if a person wants to sing or say something or play something all over again from the middle somewhere, he or she does it perfectly. Whereas people like us who has entered a classroom with just enough knowledge for a class would want to know how to begin it all over again because we don't know how to take it up somewhere in the middle. What am I saying? I think the grip that we have should be total and not partial, not purposive for the purpose of a class or purpose of an exam or to make a point and so on. I think I need also to gain mastery over Google. Uh, uh, of being able to do it, why? That's an interesting element here. Why do I need to gain Google knowledge also? Please don't restrict my understanding of Google to Google alone, similar platforms. Probably I don't even know what all exists, but similar platforms. Nowadays, when I'm teaching or when I'm sharing uh, in a classroom, the tendency is halfway through, I see a hand raising. Of, by a student who asked me, but this guy here is telling this, but you are saying this, so how do we understand? Now we need to know what this guy is saying. This guy, by the way, is an author in Google or some content space. In other words, your knowledge today has to address beyond the classroom because the sources of knowledge to the student is no longer just from the student, it has to be also from, or it is from many other sources and you need to be in terms with it. Every student today has a second opinion or third opinion, as it were, by looking at what Google says, what, what uh, uh, Wikipedia says or what something else says. I'm not saying you should therefore master in that sense, everything of that nature to silence them, but be able to deal with them. That's the skill that we need to acquire. That's a grip that I need to have. A third point, I, sorry, I keep going back to Dr. Shastri, but one of the reasons why I have my admiration for Dr. Shastri is, he's known more, not just in Karnataka, but throughout the country. He will now be known as the Vice Chancellor in the performance there, but he's also known because of being a fepsologist. And when I listen to his analysis, his and people of his kind, they have numbers in their fingers and they deal with these numbers in all kinds of figures and shapes and designs. What am I saying? We now live in a digital world. And I think as a sociologist, as a non-STEM student, if I may say, I went into whatever field I went was because I was terrible in, in mathematics. I was terrible in statistics. I'm supposed to be very good in sociology, but if only I had better control and understanding grip over numbers, I probably could have done far better because data today is available in, in abundance, but I don't know what sense to make out of the data. So if I were to have another chance, I would have a better grip over numbers and to deal with those numbers. My fourth grip that I need to have is to get 
I'm just coining a word. I hope uh, Professor Srinivas will pardon me. It is gizmoscritized. He used a concept called Sanskritized, but I think in order to now grow, I have to be gizmoscritized. I can go on talking about it, but then I'll be departing from the central thing. I need to be far more familiar with gizmos. I don't know, uh, Dr. Joshi and uh, uh, Dr. Agarwal, I don't know if you noticed, I was being very smart when I told you, how will I enlarge the screen? How will I make share my screen? How will I focus on this and so on? I need to really come to terms with all this today. A senior citizen, retired, pandemic driven, lockdown at home and so on and still be active on a Zoom meeting. So I need to be really technologically familiar with everything. So I call that as gizmoscritized, just as handcritized. Next, I'm no longer, I no longer have an audience, a captive audience in a classroom. One of the my sixth point footnote, one of the comments I got from my students was, sir, you should have allowed us from time to time to look outside the window. If they were sitting in a classroom and looked out of the window, I would just snap my fingers and say, look back at me. So I would have the attention. But I don't think I'm able to now control the attention of the audience here. And three days ago, I had a, a, a some source, I don't know how I came to know about it. I think some news, flash news, which said from now on, Zoom is building an inbuilt facility for you to play games. So I may be talking so passionately, but then I will have no knowledge whether they're actually playing solitaire or some other game by using the Zoom platform. What am I saying? My challenge or the grip I have to have is how to now keep the attention of my listeners so that I can do my business, so that I can share a business with you, then you're playing and my speaking of something, neither of which meet each other. I can go on listing the others. I'll, slip, I'll skip the beyond borders because today I can't, just because I got my PhD from studying a village in Karnataka, or I am from Karnataka, or I am from Bangalore. And if I'm giving a talk about something which has much wider audience, I can't go on harping on Hamare gaon mein ye ho raha tha, Hamare gaon mein ho raha tha. You have to go a little beyond your, your own specific domain of knowledge. I think the challenge today is how to speak, how to teach in a manner where you are accepted globally and not just locally. I'm sure Dr. Shastri will also agree if I was a better teacher, it was because I was able to address audience from different cultures, different nations too, because I have to therefore use euphemisms, expressions, language, and so on, which are understandable, not culture specific, but culture free. I need to have a grip because I don't think I had that all these years. I would somehow, just because I knew a cow, I would tie the cow to a tree and describe the cow. Whereas I ought to have described the tree. By the way, this is an example my children used to give that how will you prepare and how will you write an exam? They would say, I know the buffalo, Papa. I can write whatever else I have to do. I'll just tie the buffalo to a tree and describe the buffalo. So the answer is for the tree and so on. Last. This I have spoken at length in my previous talk uh, in the company of uh, Dr. Shastri's, and that is a certain amount of indiscipline. If only I had a better understanding of economics, a better understanding of political science as a discipline or other disciplines, probably I would have been a far better teacher rather than just being a frog in the well of sociology. But somehow, my, my discipline was so disciplined that I never became indisciplined. I ought to have had, I mean, I think I, as the example I gave you was, if only I had a better understanding of rational choice theory or the game theory, probably I would have understood and explained what I'm observing today in a much better manner than this. I don't have the tools and therewithal for it. 
the point I'm making is try and acquire as much related disciplinary understanding as possible than looking at it like, I don't know what the Hindi expression is for, but the horse uh, blinds. No, I think we, we need to go beyond that. Anything else? I have one last comment to make. And that is recycle your research into your teaching. I told you earlier, I did more of my research for almost 20 years, I was engaged in research. For about 12 years, I was engaged in teaching. When I go on NAC visits or accreditation visits, I ask my people when they come back and report, I have done that research, this research and so on. I tell them how much of it is involved in your own teaching. Unfortunately, we, have, we are chasing two different directions. One wheel is rolling on one direction and the other is rolling in another direction, research and teaching. Neither informs the other. What we really, as that's what I would like to do if I were to start my career today, engage in research in such a manner that my research becomes a subject matter for teaching. Then you will know you have to be engaged in better research when you engage in teaching. Likewise, engage in teaching which arouses doubts, questions, hypotheses, rest them afresh and engage in research. I think there has to be an interfeeding process rather than two divergent processes. This is something that I would want to engage in. Maybe I didn't do enough of that. So when I look back and if I started all over again, these were some of the things over which I would have had a grip and I would have attempted. But as I told you, no regrets. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for your sharing your uh, wonderful experience we have with your thought, which I could understand uh, as we educationists should always take the initiative to learn uh, something new and explore more uh, than students so that they have the urge to be curiosity, new knowledge, if we can start with the ourselves to make the change. And uh, we can impart and guide the same to students, to scholars, as well as other people also as well. Uh, I have a quick questions from the participant side. So uh, quickly, I'm just reading. Uh, the first question from Dr. Roli Agrawal, from uh, your experience, sir, what could be some ways to make of making students more receptive towards a subject so that they go beyond the syllabus? So that's the first question from Dr. Roli Agrawal. Um, <clears throat> please recall, <clears throat> it's been a long time since I spoke like this, so I need to clear my throat. Uh, please recall my earlier statement about there is no one best way or the only way of doing it. There are different occasions and contexts when you could do it. And I do remember or re recall many ex experiences when I could have engaged in this kind of uh, uh, a, nego a discussion, a discourse with my students, although they were not necessarily part of the syllabus. But it lies in your intelligence. Among the many ways by which you could do it, please underscore what I'm saying. It lies in your intelligence, how you can link a meaningful relevance to whatever else you may want and what has been prescribed as syllabus. It's, it's, it's basically outsmarting the system. The system says this, but you have to outsmart it by taking out something. In my discipline, there are any number of ways, any number of ways by which you could do this. I would go to a classroom. I remember one example that I used to mention there was a debate about class and status in the Indian context. There's a classic book, which was a prescribed textbook, Andre Betty as caste, class and power. And no matter how much I theorized and talked 
it made no sense to them and i gave an example how there is a tendency for class to be coterminous with an occupation or a position within the occupation thus for example when a member of a certain caste became let us say the chief librarian or the vice chancellor people would look at him more as a dalit vice chancellor or whatever caste vice chancellor he was rather than from his or her qualifications skills what am i saying here you have to link this relevant experience that you may have had which is not prescribed in the syllabus but to make sense of what that this person needs to know but this will not exhaust the various ways and means of doing it i told you there is no one best way but there are many ways use your intelligence but but when you do so please make sure it is not politically incorrect or it is not legally inappropriate and so on be very sure of it sure thank you sir so is there another question which is very connected to us and you have already mentioned the gizmos criticized uh, concept in your ppt and as a faculty the, all the faculties are facing the problem and that's the biggest challenges nowadays and anita ladda asked the same question about to the present scenario situation in the covid time today in online classes we are not able to know about the student whether they are attending it or not the reason may be either lack of sincerity or technical issues or both it distracts us a number of times suggest suggest measures to handle this situation what was the concept i used dismoscritize i would use that here you see if there were ways by which over a period of time if i were to do this say another week or 10 times more uh, a zoom lecture like this which i have done sufficiently enough but for me to be able to grasp the responses reactions doubts and so on i should also be capable of multitasking when i am doing this and the multitasking with technology that is there so i need to also at the bottom click on chats so there may be a student who may have a question raised or i'm sorry i didn't get that point can you please repeat and so on and i should now as i go on in this new mode of learning i need to become skilled in that respect but at the moment all of us if i may dare saying this to shastri i hope i'm not offending any of your colleagues uh, if i do please apologize or explain to them i meant well and i said this we all if you don't mind you all are in the same state as i started my career of going to a classroom without enough preparation where i have begun to swim but freestyle not looking at the elegance whether i'm doing it in style or in proper manner or foul no we all have to have online classes so we are having online classes without really trying to now improvise this engagement i think in a couple of months time not because pandemic has to exist but i think just as there are alternative forms of work that has become systematically institutionalized work from home becomes now a new mode of work so learning too or teaching too has is likely to be that or we must have this with us anyway i don't want to give a lecture about potential existence or continu continuation of pandemic but given this given the question by dr ladda i need to now point out that we need to also gizmotize gizmot what's the word i use sir uh, gizmos uh, criticize <laughs> and and yet to master the expression but i i like the expression so i used it we have to do that so i get that by the way this is my seventh footnote this question that i asked was one of the ways to ascertain whether or not you were engaging you were sincere in my in listening to me or not but i won't ask a question i'm going to ask you this question to answer no i will engage in a debate in a dialogue in a panel discussion in this manner to evoke a response and that assures me good there is enough understanding of what happened 
Actually, there is a bias likely to be the visible bias, those who are visible to me. But I think in due course, even that I must learn how to scroll the screen to make sure I get to know who else is listening or what's happening to their faces and so on. That's my response. Actually, as you mentioned in the avatars um, in the beginning, so we have now this is the different kind of avatar we have to show ourselves in during this lockdown time to perform ourselves in in through the this use this technology. So this is a different kind of avatars uh, which you have already mentioned in the beginning. <laughs> okay, so the next question from Anshika Makijani uh, uh, that said that. Uh, would you like to know your viewpoints on how to empower teachers to be leader? I think this again is, uh, uh, dep it depends upon who is responding to you. Uh, first of all, over the years, uh, not just in the states with which I'm familiar, I made this observation in one of the sociological conference meeting. I think it was in Jammu where I said this and it was criticized for being too elitist and urban, metropolitan centric rather than Mofisil centric. But the point I wish to make is that we need to develop competence and self-confidence. What teachers today lack is some minimum self-confidence. And when you're lacking in your own confidence, in confidence, I think leadership cannot come by proxy. Secondly, my response to uh, Dr. Makin, Makijani, uh, did I get the name right? Yes, yes, Makijani. Uh, in response to that is, why do we need leadership or do we have one typical kind of leadership? What we require is a certain type of leadership for teachers. There are quite a few management kind of leadership, which uh, one of the professors whom I met earlier, who's business school person, he will have a different theory about leadership. But I think the leadership quality for a teacher is of a different kind. Now I cannot at the moment elaborate on that, but I need to recognize that. Why do we need this leadership? So what kind of leadership are we addressing? Accordingly, we need to do it. But as long as you have control over what you are supposed to be doing, meaning teaching, I think already the essential ingredient of leadership is built in. Because your interaction with the 80% the of your interaction with your student is based on the knowledge that you're able to share with the person. And if you keep possess, if you possess some control over it, I think already you have the ingredients of leadership. How you develop it is another matter. I think you should engage in a further discussion with Dr. Shailaja Shastri on this. If I say anything more, she will feel I'm encroaching her, her field of specialization. Please move on. Why do you skip the Nupur question? Yes, Dr. Nupur yes, is asking I'm an interesting Nupur, Nupur uh, Tiwari. Yes, Nupur. How does... Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't want to embarrass you, but probably you scrolled it faster. I just I'm to say question to Nupur Tiwari. How does one foster effective collaboration between teachers? How does one foster effective collaboration between teachers in the current scenario since everything is virtual and most people like to work in a, uh, in a silo? Actually, collaboration becomes much more easier now than earlier because you don't have to physically go over, at least the TADA is saved or the trouble of having to travel is saved. Collaboration becomes much easier. But talking of collaboration, uh, I address this keeping the internal quality assessment also in mind because that's another ingredient for ranking. Talking of collaboration, please do not engage in collaboration for the sake of having a collaboration. First and foremost, identify collaborable areas of interest and then collaborate. But at the moment, what we're doing, what we are doing is collaborate and then look for areas of interest, which probably is like, it's more like an arranged marriage. 
50% chances of it to identify common interests before you begin to collaborate. So, so next question from Geetu is very interesting question. What do you, what you wish not to change in your entire teaching journey? Not to change. Yes. Not to change in your entire teaching journey. Yeah. Do you want a humorous response or a serious response? <laughs> My... I think your humorous uh, response. Humorous first and then serious. <laughs> <laughs> but then that's the best way of getting both, you see. Yes, or... like My humorous response would be that I would not forego my presence of mind. My presence of mind makes me my uh, makes me a better teacher. I know how to address, how to deliver, how to go about. But if I go with a closed mind and not translate that mind to the context or the situation in which, probably I would be worse than a dead log, dead wood or a, a dead uh, something. The point is, I don't want to lose my presence of mind. Now, is there something that I would not want to change? I don't want to change from being a student. I think if I was a better teacher in italics, in, in, within question marks or within parentheses, there is also an expression called SIC, sick, because alleged better teacher. But if I'm a better teacher, it is because of my ability to learn things, learn new things and build, recycle them into my understanding. But if I was a closed mind, if I said I knew all this and finished, I think I stopped being a good teacher. I would have been a good dictator. So if I don't want to change, it is probably being a student. Sounds too utopian, but that's honest truth. Thank you, sir. So the another question we have from Mr. Rohit Mishra, uh, what should teachers to do facilitate the process of knowledge transmission? You see, transmission is not like one of those uh, uh, mobile signal towers, which is so complicated to know whether or not the signals were received. So if I'm, as a teacher, if I'm, if I'm playing the role of transmitting knowledge, I should have control over what doubts I have and what doubts do occur to me. When I'm talking to you or talking to this audience here, it's not that I'm talking only to tell something that I have, but also my internet is unstable, it says. Anyway. But also, is there something that doesn't make sense to me? Do I make myself clear as to what I'm speaking about? If I'm clear only then I'm able to say what I'm saying. So if I have to transmit knowledge, I think my principal audience is myself. As long as I'm able to make sense of what I'm saying, probably I am convincing. And there can always be a question that comes back. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. I'm sorry, how is that? In the chat box, there would be many things. I think you're talking nonsense and so on. Then you're able to understand and relate yourself. In other words, you're able to make a successful transmission. So I have one question from you that is very important for me. Uh, how should one get over the sensitivity of adopting to change? Because you have already mentioned the previous question, change. So how should one get over the sensitivity of this adoptive of change? Um, actually, it's an, it's a, uh, it opens up a whole gamut of ideas, but I will focus on one dimension by way of response. You know, the question of adapting to change comes when you have closed your mind to a given state, which means anything that is not that state is not accepted and therefore not adapted. Let's say we are engaging in a teaching or a 
discussion and you raise something. To the extent I am able to say that's an interesting perspective, let me take that into the picture here and refocus, renegotiate the whole thing. Ah, that's a good idea. Let me see how it does it. Or I may then say, I'm sorry, it, it clashes with me. In other words, I am beginning to adapt already a new idea into the body, body of ideas that I have. Now I try to build space for this new idea that comes. And when this new idea develops into a newer or wider understanding, then you see the whole thing changes. I'm reminded my eighth point or seventh footnote, if I may make, I'm reminded a paper I wrote for this volume with uh, Professor Srinivas. When I said Sanskritization is also a protest, whereas the whole thesis is Sanskritization is imitation. And I wrote it's a protest. Professor Srinivas adapted it so well by picking up the phone and calling me, Karanth, what did you mean by this? And I tried to tell him whatever, but over phone, probably I was not as convincing. Said, why don't you come tomorrow in the morning? And I went and had wonderful dosa in his house. And over the breakfast, I talked about why I thought it was a protest. A Dalit or a lower caste person started wearing the dress of an upper caste person by saying, if you can wear, I can also wear. Agar tu kar sakte ho, mai tera baap hu, mai bhi kar sakta hu. <laughs> Did I use Hindi correctly, by the way? <laughs> but the point is, here was an adaption, I mean, a, a new idea that came. It probably did not exist those days because social structure was that. Now the change has occurred in such a manner that people can do this. Can this now go into it? You will see in the introduction to that volume, Professor Srinivas opening with this remark. What am I looking at here? Adaption of a new idea, change, as you referred to, into a body knowledge. He was able to open it up, build it into his system of thought. If it was totally different, probably would have come up with another thesis. But that is not what you're discussing. The question was, how do we adapt to change? And this is one of the ways. Not the only way, but I have to give you an example, so I use that example. There may be many other similar examples. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to ask the question directly, please unmute yourself and ask the question. I think uh, we have had a very interesting session, not so much from the point of view of what I spoke, but from the point of view of being able to uh, arouse a few queries from you and the kind of issues that came up. If I may please be permitted, I will take the last minute to thank all of you all over again and tell you I enjoyed speaking with you. <laughs>